uh, I don't think anybody doubts that, uh, that I've done some bad things. Uh, the question is what, of course, and, and how, and maybe even most importantly, why. People constantly will ask me, why? He was born Theodore Robert Cow. For years, Cow, otherwise known as Ted Bundy, confounded authorities with his killing spree. While on death row, Bundy agrees to a series of interviews. Basically, when I reached the car, what happened was I knocked her unconscious with a crowbar. A Seattle cop hoping to coax a last confession from a serial killer just days from the electric chair. Was she alive or dead? I don't know if she was unconscious, but she it was very much alive. Instead, he hears the secret story and primal thoughts that turned Theodore Robert Cow into Ted Bundy. When and where was your first murder? You know what's going to happen if and when all this stuff goes public, if all we did was just hit the who's and the when and the body count? It's January 1989, and the clock is ticking on the life of serial killer Ted Bundy. He is seven days away from execution. Florida authorities are not going to allow him to avoid the electric chair again. First of all, Ted Bundy, seven days is an awful short time for a death warrant. Why is that? It's almost 11 years since the crime was committed, so I don't consider it to be short at all and uh, I believe the uh, death warrant was properly signed and that justice needs to prevail and it should take place uh, next Tuesday. Bundy was convicted of killing two college students and a 12-year-old girl in Florida. Now police investigators are trying to get Bundy to admit he also killed dozens of other women in a multi-year cross-country rampage. One of those investigators is former Seattle detective Bob Keppel who has been hunting Bundy for more than a decade. Now, Keppel wants to know what Bundy is willing to say about other missing women. Testing one, two, three, four, five, six. Make no bones about it. I am looking for an opportunity to tell the story as best I can in the way that makes sense to me and the way that'll help not just you or the families, but that's very important but also to help my own family. Uh, I don't think anybody doubts that I've done some bad things. Uh, the question is what, of course, and, and how, and, and maybe even most importantly, why. To me, the why never caught anybody. So cops in their mentality think of what, where, when, and who. And so we're kind of stuck with you wanting why. I'm not trying to convince you, Bob, that you should be interested in the why if you're not. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of people are. I know I am, uh, and I think a lot of people are interested in why. People constantly will ask me why. A lot of people are interested as to why he did what he did, but I wanted to find out as much detailed information as I could rather than just that. I mean, he could have said anything. Well, let's, uh, let me start with one. Let me start this way. The unidentified remains. This is where I'm a little bit, uh, the presence of the officers down here is a little bit unnerving. Some of the stuff I don't mind talking about but because they wouldn't know from Adam. I can write it down. I just don't want the police getting any kind of names at this point. He didn't want anybody to know who he was talking about. So his idea was that the best thing would be for him to write down the name and he would show it to me. Yeah, and then I'll just write the name down for you, all right? The name that I just wrote down was George Ann Hawkins. Can you hear that? I can hear you. Okay. I just wrote, I just said that the Hawkins girl's head was severed and taken up the road about 25 to 50 yards and buried in a location about 10 yards west of the road on a rocky hillside. Did you hear that? Probably you found uh, the damage to the head, the jaw in particular, probably broken. But uh, if you'd found that, you would have known who it was. Up to that dirt road, 
beyond the grassy area. I'll try to trace it here on a piece of paper. How about that? That might help a little. I'm working from some pretty old memories. Well, let's do it this way. Here's the grassy area. Here's the road coming up. Trees to the northwest of this grassy area. Yeah, he drew a map as to where her skull might be found. It was as though he buried it. But we never found the skull. I can't remember what night of the week it was. Thursday night, I believe. I don't know. 11 to 12, probably closer to 12, on a warm Seattle May night. I mean, it was, I think it was clear. Weather had been fairly good. Uh, I was moving up the alley using a, uh, a briefcase and some crutches. And the young woman walked down. I saw her round the north end of the block into the alley and stop for a moment and then keep on walking down the alley toward me. And about halfway down the block, I encountered her and asked her to help me carry the briefcase, which she did, and we walked back up the alley. Across the street, turned right on the sidewalk in front of, I think, the fraternity house on the corner there. Midway in the block, there used to be a parking lot there, dirt, surface, no lights, and my car was parked there. The interest that he had in telling us about George Ann Hawkins, he had a lot of detail about her because I believe that he wanted to give us detail about her. Basically, when I reached the car, what happened was I knocked her, knocked her unconscious with a crowbar. Did she see it? No. There were some, there were some handcuffs there, along with the crowbar, and uh, they handcuffed her and put her in the passenger side of the car and drove away. Was she alive or dead? Then? Oh no, no, she was quite, uh, she was unconscious, but she it was very much alive. Coming up. After 15 years of chasing him, investigator Bob Keppel is about to hear Ted Bundy describe for the first time how he killed one of his victims. I knocked her unconscious and strangled her. With his execution days away, serial killer Ted Bundy is about to finally confess to a crime. The killing of University of Washington student George Ann Hawkins. Seattle investigator Bob Keppel, who has been chasing Bundy for 15 years, sits with the killer on Florida's death row, recording the conversation. Passed us across up the hill, down the road, and up to the grassy area. And parked, took her out of the van, and took the handcuffs off her. I mean, she regained consciousness at this time, basically. And, uh, gee, this is probably the hardest part. I don't know. One of the things that makes it difficult is that uh, at this point she was quite lucid talking about things. It's odd the kinds of th things people say. And, under those circumstances. And she said that she thought that she had a Spanish test the next day and she thought that I had taken her to help tutor me for her Spanish test. It's kind of odd, it's an odd thing to say. To hear him talk in detail about the ride from the UW out to the Issaquah crime scene, that was something that only the killer would know. The long and short of it was that I, again, knocked her unconscious and strangled her and drove her about 10 yards into the small grove of trees that was there. What are you trying to Cord. By this time, it was almost dawn. It was just about dawn. The sun was coming up. And I went through my usual, I say usual routine. I went through this routine where I was just, on this particular morning, I, I was just absolutely... Again, just shocked, kind of scared to death, shocked, horrified. And I went down the road, throwing everything that I'd had 
out the window, throwing the briefcase to the crutches as the door opened and closed, just tossing them out the window. I was in a, a sheer state of panic, of just absolute horror. At that point in time, this consciousness of what has really happened is like, you break out of a fever or something, I would, that is. So I drove east on 90, at some point throwing articles out the window as I went, the articles of clothing, shoes, etc. What did you remove those? What? The shoes, clothing. Well, after we got out of the car, initially. Well, I skipped over some stuff there, and we'll have to get back to it sometime, but it's just too hard for me to talk about right now. Did you throw away some of your own stuff? Oh, sure, yeah. I threw away the roofcase and, and the crutches and all that stuff. Yeah. And the crowbar, everything. The handcuffs, everything. I, I get mad at myself a few weeks later because I'd have to go out and buy another pair. I mean, it's not comical, but that's what would happen. Now that you've got a while to think about uh, George Ann Hawkins, is there something you can tell me about her that probably only you know and we know. Well, she said everybody called her George. George? That's what she said. Or how about then she used a safety pin because apparently her blue slacks were a bit too big. When you look at her name, pinned up pants, those were things that only the killer would know. What did you do the next day? Just went back to check out the site um make sure nothing had been left there i half expected that she might not even be there that somehow that i hadn't even killed her can't remember if i found anything there or not but i want to make sure i was oh that's what it was talk about details coming back i couldn't find one of the shoes so i thought it was there but it wasn't so i went back this is the next day Got on my bicycle, rode back to that little parking lot. I knew there were police all over the place by that time, but I was kind of nervous because, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So I went back to that parking lot and I found the pierced earrings and the shoe laying in the parking lot at about five in the afternoon. So I surreptitiously gathered them up and rode off. After the police had that area? Well, you can tell me. I've seen whole streams of them driving around all over the place. They couldn't have looked in the parking lot and missed the white pant leather clog and the two white pierced ear rings. Hoops. The reason that I was so nervous about the, anything like that being found in that parking lot was <laughs> that no more than two weeks before, I had been using the same modus operandi in the same neighborhood. In front now of the same sorority house, George Ann Hawkins disappeared from, I encountered a girl going out the door. And I was drunk and I was just babbling on and I told her I worked in Olympia, that I lived in a rooming house. I, I was horrified later on, but got all the way to the car and this happened sometimes and just said, no, I don't want to do it. I said, thank you. See you later. And she walked away. But after the Hawkins thing, I was just paranoid as hell that this girl would say, you know, something weird happened to me a couple of weeks ago. This guy came along with crutches and asked me to help him. He took me to a Volkswagen said he worked in Olympia and lived here in the university district. And how many people could that apply to? So, there you are. I wanted to get as much out of him as I could. I was ready for him to, to stay alive. What's the Attorney General of Washington willing to do? Willing to do? Anything? Who is the Attorney General these days? Oh, Ken Eikenberry. Good old Ken Eikenberry. He was wondering if I could do anything to help stay his execution. I said, oh yes, I could. But I knew I couldn't. Bundy realizes this may be the last time he talks to Bob Keppel, and he makes one last plea for his execution to be delayed so he can tell Keppel more. One of the things that I'm concerned about is time. Well, we've, we've accomplished something here, but I don't feel like we've really joined heads on this thing. I don't know what you want to do. I know you've been on, on this case, so to speak, the Bundy case for a long time. I know that you must have some deep-seated feelings about it. I don't want to make too many assumptions, but here's what it comes down to to me. I want the truth, the truth that uh, it's going to be helpful to you, but the broader truth that has a, a wider application. That's my bottom line. There's just no way it can be done under these circumstances with this amount of time, and that's the way it is. I'm not holding you hostage. If you don't want to do anything with it, you're free to walk away. 
if you can put your heads together with these other law enforcement people and think of any way, I'm not asking for clemency, I'm not asking to get off, I'm not asking for sympathy, but I draw the line. We need a period of time, uh, 60, 90 days, systematically going over with everybody, bottom to top, everything I can think of, get it all down. You can use it as you see fit. I will not put myself in a position of giving it all away and not getting the kind of result that I think is best for my people. And Bob, uh, they're going to get me sooner or later. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. But you've been after this for 15 years. A couple months is not going to make any difference. Coming up, we go back 10 years to hear Ted Bundy say in another interview that he often debated with himself about whether to kill. It was a challenge to determine whether or not he would actually kill the girl. It's Sunday evening, January 22nd, 1989, Florida Stark Prison. Inside, serial killer Ted Bundy is less than 48 hours away from execution. Convicted of killing a 12-year-old girl and two college students in the Chi Omega sorority house at Florida State University, Bundy is also the primary suspect in the disappearances of dozens of other women across the United States. Seattle investigator Bob Keppel has spent years attempting to pry information out of Bundy. A former law student known for his intelligence and knowledge of how to play the legal system. Yeah, I know more about the, My class is graduating in about a month. Uh, law school. Now at the 11th hour, as he's done several times before, Bundy says he'll talk. But investigators wonder if it's just another one of his games of cat and mouse, a game that he's been playing for nearly 10 years. Ted Bundy first came to my attention in 1979 when I was working for Business Week magazine in New York. My agent called me up and asked me if I knew anything about this uh, this serial killer who was being tried down in Florida. And in fact, I, I knew nothing about Ted. His fame had not spread to New York at that time. So I went down to Florida. He was in the, uh, the Miami City Jail on trial for the Kyle Mega killing. I asked him what he wanted to get out of this deal. And he said, well, I'm innocent. And I think that if I did a book, it would be a benefit to law enforcement, how an innocent man can be caught up in this web of deceit and lies and misinformation. Well, listen, I've been kept in isolation for six months. I've been kept away from the press. I've been buried by you. You've been talking for six months. I think it's my turn now. I said, well, Ted, what I'm interested in is talking to you and, and you telling me the truth. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll tell you the truth. So the deal that we finally struck was that my partner, Hugh Ainsworth, would go west and reinvestigate all the cases against Bundy. And I would babysit Bundy in Florida. I would sit through his trial. And that's the way it began. So where were we? We're recording now. Speak up. Yeah. yeah, the red light goes on. Okay. Bundy took the witness stand wearing a sport coat and a Seattle Mariners t-shirt. Please state your full name for the record. Deal around that Bundy. It was interesting to meet him because Ted was so clever in a way that I was very unfamiliar. When I got started with Ted, I said, okay, let's take it from the top. Let's go through your life. Very quickly, it was clear that Ted thought of this as kind of a celebrity bio, that, you know, he's Ted Bundy, the cover boy. For much of their conversation, Bundy talks in circles. Where was the bridge made? One of us, the bridge made to <clears throat> attacking women versus robbing banks or uh, you know, running for president or whatever. People find various outlets for their insecurities and hostilities and tend to compensate for them in various ways, I would imagine. I don't really have a, a good answer. I didn't really have any leverage with him because he had all the knowledge in his head. So 
After quite a bit of this, one night I had an epiphany, if you will, in this miserable Florida motel room. I just sort of played back in my mind how Ted was always described by everybody as being boyish. You know, boyishly handsome, you know, boyish demeanor. And the more I thought about it, the more it occurred to me that he wasn't just boyish, but he was a boy. He seemed to be about 12 years old. So I said to myself, how do you deal with a 12-year-old who's got some really awful secrets that you want to get at? Not having any better ideas, I went into the prison and I said, Ted, you have a unique position, not only as the defendant and the suspect in all of these cases, but you're familiar with all the facts. You're a psychology student. You're a student of the human mind. And you know more about this story than anybody knows. So why don't you tell me what you think happened? How does a person become a serial killer? And he grabbed the tape recorder out of my hand and pulled it near his chin and started looking down into it and closed his eyes and started telling the story. Coming up, Ted Bundy tells Stephen Michaud what it takes to become a serial killer. Since it's based on opportunity, it's a relatively easy crime to get away with. Joseph A. Bank presents the... Serial killer Ted Bundy spent most of his life in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Tacoma and Seattle. Many of his known victims were abducted in the early to mid-1970s near the University of Washington. He would knock out the girls, drive them outside of town to the mountains east of the city, where he would rape them and then kill them. Ted was a sociopath or psychopath, and the psychopathic mind looks at interpersonal relationships utterly differently than do the rest of us. All relationships are on a power grid, and all that you're doing when you're interacting with other people is trying to get over on them. You're trying to establish your control of the situation. I asked you what, what happened from the time that there was an arrival in King County to the time that she ended up on Taylor Mountain. And you said that, uh, well, there are two possibilities. You asked me to speculate. Didn't I say speculate? I've gone through this for hours with other people, so I'm going to be very meticulous about the wording here. You asked me to describe what happened, and I can't tell you what happened. All I do is just assist you with my educated guesses. When you're being manipulated by one of these guys, especially if you're unfamiliar with it, you make mistakes. One of my earliest mistakes was to be incapable of understanding that Bundy not only was a killer, but he really enjoyed being a killer. It was his life, it was the center of his being. And everything else as this developed in his life was put into place to support what he called the entity, the part of him that was disordered, if you will. Ted conceived of himself, as he told me, as being 99% normal. And just having this little sliver where he liked to go out and bash girls over the head. Rather than being tormented by the evil, as it were, of what he had done. He was more likely to be tormented by the inability to satisfy, as frequently perhaps as he desired, the, the needs of that condition that dwelled within him. He would still be out in society viewing and being exposed to the same elements that were the very root of his disorder. And he'd still be out there being subjected to the television ads and the girly magazines and the, you know, the, the women in hot pants on the streets and all these things that, that tended to nurture his condition, exacerbate it, agitate it. When we got into stuff that was intimate about the Killians or about the entity, Ted often took the recorder and sort of left me to watch. One time we were talking about how the entity functioned in a high publicity mode. So he's driving around the road one day and he sees a girl hitchhike. Again, this is Bundy telling me the story. Though Bundy talks a lot, he never refers to himself in first person. Instead, he only talks about a killer and never gives him a name. 
attractive young teenage girl hitchhiking and picked her up and she agreed to go to his house and she got very, very drunk. They both got drunk and throughout the evening uh, they engaged in voluntary sexual activities. But throughout the evening this man would feel himself being tested, debating with himself whether to, to kill her or to just let the situation run its course. Because this was in one of his reformation periods, he sworn to himself he'd never engage in that kind of conduct again, that he wouldn't let himself get carried away like that. But faced with this very attractive girl hitchhiking, it was a challenge to determine whether or not he would actually kill the girl. This sounds really weird, but it's true. There were a couple of occasions when he would go off into one of these states. I don't know if you call it a trance or something. He'd be talking, and a welt would form right across his, his uh, left cheek. And it would go across, and it was pure white. And then when he would put down the tape recorder and light a cigarette or something, it would slowly kind of fade away. And it was like this stigmata. When the morning came around and they dressed and he took the girl back to the area where she lived, he felt as if he'd accomplished something. He could see in hindsight that the only reason he hadn't killed that girl was because in that particular evening, that condition, that entity, that disorder, was not active or aroused. It was in a period of remission. The cases that we discussed always ended in murder, because with the cases we discussed were cases that I knew about, right? And I knew something about how the girl disappeared. I knew something about how she was found. Me Show is especially interested in George Ann Hawkins, the same George Ann Hawkins Bundy spoke about to Bob Keppel and later admitted killing. Her disappearance in 1974 would come up again and again throughout Bundy's nearly decade-long string of interviews on death row. George Ann Hawkins was last seen Monday evening shortly after midnight. She had been visiting at the Beta House and was returning to her house just a half block away down this alley. Police believe she went along this route and then somewhere she disappeared. The disappearance of George Ann Hawkins from the University of Washington is an interesting case once again for the fact there is no evidence at all from just and what I find interesting about it is that she clearly has been costed and the approach would have had to have been made and within something like 40 yards because she is walking from one pool of light to another. More likely than not, she encountered someone she knew in that space of time. That's the one thing that has seemed most likely to me. The only other thing that has occurred to me is that someone with a great deal of nerve could have, as she walked under a shadow, could have clipped one upside the head mm. and just carry her off to a caveman fashion. I don't know. And you don't feel you're in a position to speculate one way or the other? We could sit here and we could say, well, we could expect this to happen, that to yeah. happen. But in the case of Hawkins, uh, it just doesn't fit. Yeah, sure doesn't. Um, it does not it doesn't, I guess, but so many other things fit that uh, you where do you draw the line? Though Bundy never talks to Michaud in first person about crimes he may have committed, he has no problem talking about how someone else may be a successful serial killer. If you think about the situation that a person like that finds himself in, he's got a corpse, uh, what is he going to do with it? I mean, ideally, he'd have an incinerator in the basement, and, you know, there wouldn't be any problem at all in that respect. And he never wastes an opportunity to turn on the charm even telling Michaud that the author may have what it takes to be just like him. I think, Steve, with enough study and interest that you too could become a fairly effective mass murderer. <laughs> that anybody has that capacity and that ability it would not seem to me, having studied the cases, that it takes a great deal of skill and thought to do it. Mm -hmm. The very nature of the crime is, that, since it's based on opportunity, that it's a relatively easy kind of crime to, uh, to get away with. Coming up, as the Seattle area deals with another string of unsolved murders, police receive a letter from Florida's death row. Ted Bundy says he knows how to catch the killer. In 1982, Seattle again witnesses the disappearances and deaths of dozens of young women. Seattle investigator Bob Keppel who had worked on the Ted Bundy task force, is again searching for clues in the rugged wilderness around the city. 
With us this morning from our affiliate KING in Seattle is Bob Keppel, the chief detective on that Ted Bundy case, now a consultant to the Green River Task Force. Now that you know something about these serial murderers, does it help you find the next one, or does it just uh, illustrate why it's so hard to find and stop these people? One of the problems is that uh, police departments don't recognize soon enough the serial. And we've been guilty for years of not communicating to each other well enough. I think there was an element of people thinking deja vu all over again. Because within the first week, there were five bodies found in or on the Green River in one spot. Once the killing started, Keppel and other members of the Green River Task Force received a strange offer of help. Ted Bundy, who was sitting on Florida's death row, said he could help police find the killer. We wanted to make sure that he was never tipped off about the real reason that we were there to talk to him. The whole idea was to get him talking about Green River, and what he would say is basically what he was doing as a killer. This is a tape-recorded interview between Bob Keppel, Dave Riker, and Ted Bundy. The date is 11-17 of 84. The time is 15-34 hours. One of the reasons that piqued my interest was some of your uh, specific things about dump sites. Obviously, you might have some special knowledge that you think you may assist us in that area. Well, first of all, he's trying to dispose of the bodies and they won't be found. This guy doesn't want to get caught. I think it's clear that over time, you can see him, at least it would appear, that over time he's trying to improve his dump sites. He's trying to get better at disposing of his bodies. And I bet she was getting nervous. He said, damn, I'm starting to find my bodies again. Because just looking at how this unfolded, I see here in my dates that you found these first five really quickly. Coldfield. Chapman and Hines and Mills. You can see he changes. He's obviously not going to use that Green River anymore, at least not for a while. And um, he's looking for something that's more effective, so he goes back to dry land uh, with number six. You got to figure that a guy like Bundy has been talked to many, many, many times. There's a good chance, as clever and as smart as he was, that he may pick up on the fact that we would ask him questions that only Ted Bundy, the killer, would know. Let's say he's continuing to kill. Okay. Still in the Seattle area. We found these locations out here. What do you forward his next step be? Who knows? This guy is learning. He's trying to find the best way to dispose of these bodies he can think of. So he was returning to the depths. He does. Not just to bring bodies back, but probably in the interim. I think there's a high probability he's returning to check those dump sites out after he's dumped the body there. I can almost guarantee it. How about after we found them? Oh, oh, he touch a 10-mile pole. You see, that's the problem. I think that he was of the belief that we couldn't draw anything out of him. He wanted to be a kingpin, tough guy. I'll answer the questions. He was always talking with us like he was in control. But he was, in fact, talking with the wool pulled over his eyes. We asked him what we could do as investigators to help identify potential suspects. And that's when he brought up the Sex Slasher Film Festival. There's always the link between sex and violence, but I think it's safe to say that the guy fantasizes a lot and he finds ways of vicariously experiencing the thing that gets him off, which in this case is killing a woman. But just like anybody else who has an obsession, whether it be fishing or bowling or skiing, he has ways he vicariously satisfies it. And I think there's an excellent chance that one way he gets off is by going to what they call the slasher films. Uh, now, I know this sounds weird, but what I would do if I were trying to bring this guy to me, I'd find the bloodiest, coolest slasher movie that's out there in the can that's never been shown in the Pacific Northwest. A really vivid, lurid, sex murder kind of flip. The investigators decide to go for broke. What they really want Bundy to do is talk about his involvement in his own crimes. Can you see Ted Bundy contacting us in the future and saying, ready to talk? Yes, I, I, I can see myself uh, talking to you sometime in the future. How about within the next two or three hours? <laughs> <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> 
certainly like to be able to uh, help. Bundy doesn't help. Instead, he continues to lead investigators down dead ends. Keppel leaves Florida, thinking he would never see Bundy again. Don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but uh, if and when Ted is finally executed, uh, what would your feelings be? I don't know what they'd be right now. I can tell you more about that when it happens. But four years later, Keppel returns. Bundy is still on death row. Keppel wonders if he can finally get Bundy to admit to something. Keppel visits the prison unannounced. This time, Keppel doesn't want to talk about the Green River Killer. He wants to talk about Ted Bundy. He didn't know why I was there. The only reason I was there was to talk to him. I didn't have a reason other than that. How does a detective talk to somebody without judging? That's hard. That's, that's very hard. The scary thing is you have to have real empathy. Real, not phony. Not just calling the guy by his first name or shaking his hand or giving him a cup of coffee and cigarettes and going through all the, the standard procedure of putting a guy at ease, which is important. But there has to be a real empathy, which impossible as it may sound, lacks judgment. They have a, a particular view of the world that you have to discover. Why does this one guy, for example, not want to talk about the 12 and 13 year olds he killed? And he may have killed a dozen. Mm -hmm. But he'll talk about all the prostitutes he killed. His particular morality of murder, if you will, was such that he could talk about some, but not others. He could tell you the truth about some, but not others. His morality of murder was that it was OK to kill. Because the system, as it stands now, is not really geared to getting at the truth. I mean, what motivations would there be for someone in that position to talk to you, talk to anyone? How about somebody like yourself? Obviously, a student in a game, and admitted by your own admission several times that you really like talking to other people about this stuff. You obviously like talking to me about it, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Well, with me, I do enjoy it, and yet that interest ebbs and flows. There's sometimes I'm more interested in talking about it than others. I mean, it's certainly not something that I. I would rather do than anything else. I mean, if I had a choice, I'd rather be outside running around yeah. in the sunshine. Coming up, Seattle detective Bob Keppel has one last chance to get information out of the nation's most notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. When and where were you first murdered? I think one of the things to be made clear here to law enforcement, which I think they realize, is that you don't negotiate with a murderer. You don't negotiate with a killer. He certainly could have come clean, and now all of a sudden, he wants to tell the truth. Therefore, this is a public statement in response to inquiries that uh, we are not considering that request. Every news agency in the world knew Tuesday morning was it. It's less than two days before Bundy's scheduled execution. Keppel interviews Bundy for two hours. He is one of the last members of law enforcement to sit down with the killer. In the end, Bundy admits to killing more than a dozen additional women and gives police leads on a dozen more. Sunday was my last time to talk to him, so I went in for my two-hour session. He was exhausted. He was out of it. And I was pushing him hard. The only thing that we could possibly cover that may add to some of the answers is a location of Donna Manson, because she's the one that's missing. And we never found anything we think is her at all. 19-year-old Donna Manson went missing on March 12, 1974 around the time Bundy first went on his killing spree. This is Highway 18 out here. There's a quarter sectional marker right here. Most of what we found was right in here. And all we found, as you can see, hair, skull, skull, jawbone, jawbone. We never found any bones. Now, are those bodies buried out there someplace? 
or are they someplace else where no one's ever found them? I won't beat around the bush with you anymore. I'm just tired, and I just want to get back and go to sleep. Okay. So let me just tell you, I, the head, however, the skull, it wouldn't be there. Where is it? It's nowhere. It's nowhere. It's, it's in a category by itself. Now, I just assume this was something that you just kept, but I can see the headlines now. Ted, there's not going to be any details. What, what you told me about George Ann Hawkins isn't going to be known. I got parents out there that don't even want to know the details. Well, I know. Yeah, well, it was incinerated. It was incinerated. Where'd you incinerate it? <laughs> Come on, partner. <laughs> These are things I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, this is probably the, the, the disposal method of preference among those who get away with it. It's the most bizarre, bizarre thing I've ever been associated with. I've been associated with bizarre. Right. Well, tell me about it. What the hell happened? That's really not that humorous, but uh, in the fireplace. Burned it all up? Down to the last ash. And then in a fit of paranoia, Cleanliness, whatever, you just packing down all the ashes. Mm hmm That's the twist. Yeah, that's a slight twist. This may have been Bundy's last chance to tell the truth, but Detective Keppel didn't buy it. Have you ever burned a skull before? Well, my problem with it is, is I don't think he could. I was anxious for him to tell me more in those last two hours. I wanted to see if he would screw up, make a mistake, tell me something that I didn't suspect him of. But he held out. I will say that about him, he held out. I'd like to ask one last question. Oh one last one. When and where was your first murder? Okay, one more question. I will have to do that some other time. I mean, oh, there is another time. He was at once bright, articulate, and a monster. He confessed to murdering more than 20 young women, and he was a suspect in several more killings. But only at the end did he talk freely about his behavior. I went home on Monday. I figured it wasn't worth me being there. I didn't care to see him executed. I'd seen enough dead people in my time. Didn't need to worry about him. The signal has now come shortly after 7 o'clock. That's it, that's it. Ted is sort of the platinum standard for serial murder. Basketball, there's Michael Jordan, there's Babe Ruth, and in his specialty, there's Ted, and there's nobody near him. That's correct. And is it substantially the same? Ted offends the mind. He was as credible a young man as he could possibly be. Looked good, spoke well, intelligent, all these things, and yet he was a pervert on the evidence. He murdered girls buried them, dug them up, and buried them again. He bashed in their skulls. He really was into it. It was his favorite thing to do. He didn't tell the truth. Sure, he told the truth about pieces of things, but there were so many things that he didn't tell the truth about. You ever physically harmed anyone? Ever physically harmed anyone? No. No. You know, uh, again, not in the context, I think, that you're, you're speaking of. 